So this is the structure of the ad. I mean, in that to be able to understand um, what is going on, I will go through the normal flow uh, of blood through the ad into the system and then uh, what it, it entails and what you need to know about some few things um, about flow of blood in the heart, and then you can understand um, what is going on. Um, usually, um, if this is your heart, um, there, there's a septum between the left side of your heart. So this is the right side. This is the left side. There's a septum between the right side um, of your heart and, uh, and the left. Um, blood return from your head um, through a structure called superior vena cava. And based on the name, is superior. So it's removing blood from the top portion of your body, from, from your head, upper uh, um, extremities. So it's called superior vena cava. And then in the lower leg, all the blood in the lower leg uh, goes to a big vein. The the vena cava means a big vein, basically. So you have inferior vena cava. Um, um, so that's how you spell it, vena cava. It's just a big vein that collects all the blood from the rest of your body. Uh, and then they dump the blood into a structure called um, right atrium. So this is the right atrium. This blood is blood that doesn't have any um, oxygen in it. Most of the oxygen is being taken out. So this is the oxygenated blood going into the right atrium. And then it goes through a valve. Okay, this valve is called trascopic valve, and the blood get into the right ventricle. And from the right ventricle, all this blood is deoxygenated, so minus oxygen. That's what it means. There is no oxygen in it. So blood from the upper portion of your body through this big vein, superior vena cava, and the lower portion of the body, inferior vena cava, dump this blood into uh, the lower extremities, uh, into the right atrium. And then and the right atrium um, pump the blood into the uh, right ventricle through this tricuspid valve. Um, what the right ventricle is supposed to do is to push the blood to the lung so that oxygen can be added to it to, it to become oxygenated. So if this is your lung, long sitting here like that, this blood, um, the oxygenated blood, this the oxygenated blood from the right ventricle, what it will do is it go into your lung like that, into a vessel called pulmonary artery. So blood is now, this deoxygenated blood is going into the pulmonary artery uh, from the right ventricle. After oxygen is being added into it, so oxygen, oxygen here is added to the blood. Now it becomes oxygenated and it, it needs to return back to the heart. And so this blood go from here from the lung into the left atrium, the left atrium. So this blood here, this is the left atrium. This blood is now as oxygen in it. So this is oxygenated blood. There's a valve here, this is called a mitral valve, which then direct blood flow in one direction. The valves direct blood flow in one direction into the left ventricle. The left ventricle is thicker than the right ventricle. And it is this left ventricle that pump blood to the rest of your body through a vessel called 
um, aorta. So I'm going to use this grain and it's from the left ventricle, you're going to have this vessel to the rest of the body. So this is the aorta. From here, blood can go to your head and your lower extremities, and then it recollect back into the superior vena cava and inferior vena cava and to the rest of your body. So this is this is all oxygenated blood through the aorta to the rest of your body. So this is the normal blood flow. So blood flow in one direction from the left side into the, from the right side into the lung so that um, oxygen can be added to it. And then you go back to the left side of the heart and then pump to the rest of the body. So this go to the rest of the body. Uh, for you to utilize the oxygen um, in your, um, to, to do work physically, to be able to move for brain to use it, your kidney, the rest of your body um, needing the oxygen. So this is a normal blood flow. Um, and this is usually what happened. And therefore, um, and you can see from this, um, based on what I've drawn, this is the normal flow. Anatomically, when you look at the, the, the picture, this is exactly what um, I've drawn is the same thing. This is the, the left side of, right side of the heart. This is the left side of the heart. And this is the aorta with branches going to different portion of the body. You don't need to know that but this is, we call it BC sacs. Basically that's the name of the vessels, brachiocephalic, common, carotid, subclavian, and it branches into the rest of the body and it supply the whole rest of the body. The blue is the vessels that go to the, um, it did it lungs. And so this is what we have. Unfortunately, unfortunately, um, unfortunately, this structure doesn't, this what I've drawn is not always not going to be what it is. Um, during development and biologically, things can happen that all these stretches doesn't form. You, do, you may have separation between, there's a hole between right ventricle and left ventricle or right atrium between a left atrium or the pulmonary. This is the pulmonary vein that retain blood from the lung to the heart um, and the aorta may be abnormally located, the pulmonary artery may not be there. And therefore, we have to pay attention. That is what the heart disease, a congenital heart disease is all about, uh, that you may not have those stretches anymore, the way they're supposed to be. Um, so, um, so basically, you have different kind of um, a, a, a defect that is going to happen. And then I'm going to show you, because of the things that happen during development, um, you have different kind of holes and the structure of the heart is not normal. And so you have these defects um, that can lead to different kind of uh, how the blood flow. You know, the blood flows from the right side to the lung and then to the uh, left side of the heart and pump out. But sometimes you can have these holes that causes the blood to follow different pathways. And one of them is they cause the blood to move from the left side to the right side. Uh, and that is where the shunts usually, we call them shunts. And these are examples of um, a, a left to right shunt. And um, we're going to 
tackle each of them. So for um for for VSD, this is we call it ventricular septal defect. That means in the ventricle. So when you have the ventricle, this is the heart. In between them, you have the valves here. And this is the right side. This is the left side. There is a hole between the ventricle. This is the right ventricle. And this is the left ventricle. There is incomplete fusion of the septum such that there's the hole here. You have a hole here. And so blood is mixing. Blood is mixing between the right side and the left side. But because the left side is stronger than the right side, blood moves from left to right. So this is what we call ventricular septal defect. You have blood moving from left to right shunt. Remember the blood on the right side, the left side has oxygen. So there is oxygen there. So you have oxygenated blood here. Um, I'll make it red. You have oxygenated blood here, and then you have deoxygenated blood here on the right side. So there is mixing of blood, but then it will go into the systemic circulation. Because you've had blood that is already have oxygenated and it has gone to the lung and some of them is still being mixing, most of the blood will be oxygenated. Therefore, these patients doesn't have cyanosis. Um, so they are acyanotic at birth. So they are acyanotic at birth. So they usually are no blue, basically. That's the another way to say. Um, so they they are they have normal color, they are asynotic at birth. For ventricular septal defect, they specific um that means they, they don't have symptoms at birth. But as this thing continue, uh, we'll talk about what happened with left to uh, right shunt, what kind of symptoms they're going to have. Um, so they are asynodic at birth. Something specific about ventricular, ventricular septal defect that they like to ask you guys is uh, what kind of mama um, do you hear with ventricular septal defect? The, the classic one is called harsh mama with... Um, um, ventricular septal defect. So you hear it whenever a patient has ventricular septal defect, you hear an ash mama. Um, it's clinics. So that is the briefly about ventricular septal defect. The same thing, atrial septal defect. So this is the heart. This is the separation. This is the right atrium. This is the right ventricle. No, left ventricle. And there's a hole between the atrium. No, left atrium, sorry. There's a hole between the, 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 the ventricles in the atrium such that blood is mixing between the right atrium and the left atrium. And, but because the blood it, it, that is mixing is oxygenated already. Blood from the left side is going back to the right side. Uh, the patient or the client is still acyanotic and they have no symptoms at birth. Um, so this is a, a left to right shunt. So there's a hole between the atriums. And the blood, the pressure on the left side pushes the blood, oxygenated blood, into the right side. And then patient will not be cyanotic. Uh, and then they will lead to left to right shunt. Um, one specific thing you need to know about atrial septal defect 
is the, the mama, classic mama that they have. Usually is a systolic mama, but this is different. He has fixed split mama. And that is classic for um, atrial septal defect. So when you're looking for atrial septal defect mama, it's a systolic mama, but it's very fixed uh, and it's split at H2. Split, fixed, split, H2, systolic mama. Pay attention. This is what they like to ask you. Um, uh, uh, they try to ask you um about what kind of mama you're going to hear and and and, and so so and so so this is a fixed split systolic mama remember these are defect in the um in the right atrium and the left atrium the ventricular septal defect is between the left uh, atri left ventricle and the right ventricle these two need to be repaired for left to right shunt, but it doesn't need to be repaired right away. Um, so like I said, acyanotic, the, these patients are acyanotic, it's a left to right shunt. Um, you hear a fixed plate mama, and this is like a sata question they can ask you. Um, they can trick you. It's a patient doesn't have any symptoms at birth. It's a cyanotic, uh, it's a left to right shunt, you hear a fixed split and, and systolic uh, H2 mama, uh, um, and specifically for atrial septal defect. We continue. So PDA, PDA is called, uh, usually um, when you have the heart like that, you have the ventricle, septal, you have the right ventricle, left ventricle, left atrium, right atrium. And I told you the pulmonary, let me use the blue, pulmonary artery, take blood from the right ventricle. And then the um, aorta, take blood from the left ventricle. When the baby is inside the mother in utero, the lung is not developed, and therefore there is a, a connection between the pulmonary artery and the aorta. There is a connection here. So blood from the right ventricle get try to go into the um long but because there may be there is stenosis here it's not developed well and the and the lung is not developed worse therefore blood is shunted into the aorta um and this is normal when you are inside your mother in, in utero so blood is shunted from the pulmonary artery into the aorta and then it go into your uh, systemic um to the to the systemic circulation because the baby is getting most of the oxygenated blood from the mother. This is what we call ductus arteriosus. It's normal circulation. In normal circulation, you have this ductus arteriosus taking blood from the pulmonary artery into the aorta, and then the aorta sent into the uh, um, systemic circulation for the baby to have oxygenated blood because the lung is immature. Um, as soon as the baby is born, this connection usually closes. And therefore, as the long baby takes his first breath, this closes and blood from the right ventricle go into the lung and from the lung, it passes into the uh, pulmonary um, vein into the left atrium to the left ventricle before you go to the aorta. So they go back into the normal circulation. PDA means patent ductus arteriosus. That means the ductus arteriosus never closes. It never 
closes and therefore it persists on when the kid is born. So it did not close, um, but it persists um, when the child is born. Because it's a left to right shunt, as you can see, um, when it persists, now blood from the left side will go to the right side. In the normal, uh, and in utero, blood moves from the right to the left through the ductus arteriosus. But when the baby is born and the ductus arteriosus never closed, now blood is shunting from left, from the pulmonary artery, I mean, a, a shunting from the aorta back into the pulmonary circulation. So it become left to right shunt. Since it's a left to right shunt, the kid is still a cyanotic. So it's not going to be blue, okay? The, 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 the kid is still a cyanotic. Um, it's not going to be blue. Um, they have a classic mama that they like to ask in your question, an endless question, and it's called Olo Systolic Mama. This is classic. They like to ask you, what kind of mama do you hear for PDA is Olo Systolic Mama? Olo Systolic Mama means you can hear it both as systole and, and diastole throughout the system, or the other name they call it is loud, machine-like, systolic mama. So loud, machine-like, systolic mama. Or you can hear holo systolic mama. And this is classic for that. One thing I want you to know is very important. Usually, um, during um, the fetal circulation, like I told you, the ductus arteriosus is still uh, open, okay? When it failed to close, okay? It, when it, it, it failed to close, it's because there is too much prostaglandins, PGE2. Is due to increased prostaglandins, and this is what keep the um the ductus arteriosus open. Okay, this is due to increased prostaglandins that keep ductus arteriosus open. Okay, and therefore the only what the best way to um cause if the kid is born and you want to close this ductus arteriosus, you just need to um, give them endomethacin. We take care of the inflammatory effect of the prostaglandins. And so the treatment for closure of the PDA is endomethacin. It's an NSAID, so endomethacin. It's an NSAID. That will help um, um, with the closure of the PDA. So once again, plus the glandins PGE2 keep the ductus arteriosus what open. In order to close it, you need endomethacin, which will take care of the plus the glandins and block it. Because of this application, misoprostol, which you can, patients sometimes can take when they're pregnant, which is an abortive medication, can also keep close the ductus arteriosus. Misoprostol can cause the ductus arteriosus to close. So pregnant lady taking this medication should be 
instructed to stop it, not because it's going to cause abortion, but secondly, it can close the uh, uh, ductus arteriosus in prematurely in the kid and uh, while they are in the in, in utero. So you want the, the mother to stop taking it. Otherwise, it will cause the ductus arteriosus to close, mesoprostol, which usually causes the um, decrease in prostaglandin secretion, and therefore that causes the ductus arteriosus to close inside in utero. So once again, high level of prostaglandins keep the PDA open inside the, the baby. As soon as it's born, the level of prostaglandin goes down and then the P and the ductus arteriosus closes. If it persists, it is called patent ductus arteriosus. And the best way to close this is to give them endomethacin. This is a left to right shunt. So that is all the three we've talked about, left to right shunt. And then we talk about this having an olosystolic mama or large machinery mama for PDA, and fixed split and systolic mama um, at S2 for atrial septal defect. And this is the hash mama, both of all of them All of them are um, left to right shunt. So this is what is going to happen. Now we have left to right shunt. Look at it. So you have, this is the heart and you having blood this is the left side, this is the right side, the lung is here. Blood is being shunted to the right side, or most of the blood is getting shunted to the right side. Initially, the kids, uh, when they, they're born, they are asymptomatic and they are asymptomatic. They don't have symptoms, but as soon as more blood keep on getting shunted from the left side to the right side. When, I, 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 after eight to four weeks, they start getting symptomatic. Blood now is being pumped from the left side to the right side, and then is going to the lung. So the lung become overwhelmed. So therefore, they will start to have symptoms of Heart failure. So by four to eight weeks, as the the lung get overwhelmed, they will start to have symptoms of heart failure. So you have pulmonary congestion. More blood goes into the lung, and they will develop heart failure. Congestive heart failure. So as more blood get into the lung and the lung become congested and then they develop CHHF. And then they, they start having symptoms mostly of the lung. So they become the kidney. And then their heart rate start getting hot because the lung is being overwhelmed. So they become tachycardic. And then because um, the, of lack of blood going to the system, um, the, their metabolic activity increase. So metabolic rate increases. Because of metabolic rate increases, they have poor weight gain. So these are symptoms, you see signs and symptoms of patients who have left to right shunt. Initially, when they're born, they are a cyanotic, they have no symptoms, they look okay. 
by getting to four to eight weeks, they the lung become overwhelmed but by blood being shunted from the left side back to the lung. So more blood go to the lung and they develop pulmonary conjunction um, because there's too much blood now staying in the heart rather than going to the systemic circulation, they develop CHF. And because more blood get into the lung, they become tachypnic. And because now the heart has to pump most of the blood that is being given, they become tachycardic. Their metabolic rate decreases because it increases because they need to utilize any oxygen that they have and they develop poor weight gain. Um, when a kid is born, feeding is a form of exercise. And so when they feeding, they, they, because it's an exercise for kid, when you're giving a kid a uh, newborn bottle feed or uh, breast, they're feeding, it's an exercise for them. So when you're exercising, you release what we call catecholamines, catecholamines like epinephrine. So high level of epinephrine, this is also increases their tachycardia. Because of this, they can be diaphoretic when they feed in. Because they're exercising, they can be diaphoretic when they feed in and uh, also related to the pulmonary congestion. So all this thing I've listed, you can see that this may be things they can ask you for such a question. Like, what do you see in a kid with the left to right shunt? They have poor weight gain. First of all, they have pulmonary conjunction because blood is now being pumped back to the right, left side, right side of the heart from the left, and they go back to the lung more blood stayed within the heart. So now you have CHF, congestive heart failure. And then the, 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 because the lung is over congested, they become tachypnic, you know? Um, and then the, the, the heart has to pump faster, more to push all the blood that it has that will develop tachycardia. And um, what is going to happen their metabolic rate is going to increase in order to utilize anything that they have, any oxygen, and they develop poor weight gain. And because feeding for them in the kid is, a, is an exercise, more catecholamine will be released. And this catecholamine can make them diaphoretic or is due to the pulmonary conjunction. And you have such a question for you. And this is how they can trick you. They can combine uh, right to left shunt, left to right shunt. So these are the things you should pay attention to when um, they, they're talking about left to right shunt. They are still asyanotic. So be careful. These are still asyanotic. Cyanotic. So these are the symptoms you see for all left to right shunt. So moving forward, now we will talk about the right to left shunt. Now blood is being shunted from the right side of the heart to the uh, um, left side of the heart. This is the, the problem um, I will This is a big issue. They, 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 they all, um, let me go back. The best way to remember whether this is a right to left shunt is there's a trick. In a multiple choice question, all of them have the word T at the beginning. So if they give you like a couple of shunts and they ask you which one is um, right to left, 
it has to start with T. We have tetralogy of Fuller, uh, tranquil arteriosis, transposition of great vessel, and total anomaly of a pulmonary vein. They all start with what? T. We're going to go through each of them. The most common one is tetralogy of Fuller and then transposition of great vessel. But this is the number one they, they like in your um in your exam. Um so we will go to each of them. I will describe them briefly. You don't need to know too much, but to have an idea of what is going on. We will start with this: the tranquil arteriosis. So this is the this is the heart, okay, like we talk about, and then you have the the right atrium here, the right ventricle, the left atrium, the left ventricle. And then what is going to happen, the 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 right um the right ventricle will send the blood to pulmonary artery. Okay. And then the aorta will take the blood from the left ventricle. So you have here is the oxygenated blood in from the left from the right ventricle, and you have oxygenated blood from the um, left ventricle. In tranquil arteriosis, you just have only one vessel, so you have something like that. This is the right ventricle. This is the left ventricle. You have from the right ventricle, you have one vessel from the left ventricle. So they all fuse together. So the vessel taking blood from the right ventricle and the left ventricle is the same thing. Therefore, you can see how blood here, which is oxygenated, and blood here, which is um, these are oxygenated, is mixing. And there's no way these, these people can survive. They have to have connection, septal defect, ventricular septal defect to move the blood, oxygenated blood from the left side up so that they can mix. So they need uh, ventricular septal defect or atrial septal defect to be able to mix oxygenated blood because you have just only one vessel moving blood from the right ventricle and the left ventricle. This is not uh, good for them. So that is the tranquil arteriosis. It's just to give you an idea what it means by that. Transposition of great vessels. The great vessels is the, the aorta and the pulmonary vein, no, pulmonary artery. And therefore, when you have something like that, the aorta should come from the left ventricle. This is the aorta. And the pulmonary artery should come from the right ventricle. That is pulmonary artery. In transposition of great vessel, they, they, they have switch. So you have, this is the heart. And the aorta is coming from here, from the right ventricle and pulmonary vein is from the pulmonary artery is from the, so this is the pulmonary artery, is from the left ventricle. This is not as uh, acceptable or is not compatible with life. So they need something connection. They, they also need a, Trans, um, septal defect, either ventricular septal defect or atrial septal defect to be able to um, get some oxygenated blood into their system. Um, all these things are really, they, they, they are symptomatic right away because they don't have oxygenated blood. So they need to have something as soon as possible to be able to survive. Total anomaly of uh, pulmonary uh, vein. That means the pulmonary vein retain blood from um, the, the, the lung to the uh, left atrium, oxygenated blood. These people, they don't have it. 
which is not compatible to life. So that thing, that one too is a big problem. They have to figure out ways. So all these patients need surgery right away. And they are symptomatic. As soon as they are born, they are symptomatic. But we'll go over them, what, the, what you see. Let's now talk about the big one, tetralogy of Foley. Okay, so in tetralogy of Foley, this is the, the hat, okay? And the lung is here. You have the right ventricle here. You have left ventricle, right atrium, left atrium, and the lung is here. And this is the pulmonary artery, taking blood from the right ventricle. This is the oxygenated blood, okay? So that the lung can oxygenate this blood. The problem is this pulmonary and put it, let me use yellow. This pulmonary um, artery is stenose. So the pulmonary artery stenosis, PAS. So blood cannot move from the right ventricle it, yeah, into the lungs so that they can get blood in it. This oxygenated blood, the oxygenated blood cannot get into the lung. So you have this deoxygenated blood sitting here because of the stenosis of the pulmonary uh, um, artery. And, and then they have what we call, um, because of that, the most of the blood stay in the right ventricle. And so these deoxygenated blood sits here and then it make the right ventricle a petrophy. So the right ventricle become bigger. It become bigger, bigger, Oh, sorry. It become bigger. So this right ventricle become really thickened and bigger than the left ventricle. So we have what we call hypertrophy of the right ventricle. We have pulmonary stenosis. Now think, blood need to get to the left side, okay? Is a the blood need to get somewhere. The, otherwise, um, the, 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 the individual or the patient will not get any blood. So there is a defect, there's a hole between the right ventricle and the left ventricle. So you have, this hole is the, what we call ventricular septal defect. So now you have pulmonary stenosis, making the blood, the oxygenated blood stay in the right ventricle. The right ventricle get bigger, a petrophy of the right ventricle, and then blood move from ventricular septal defect. And now you have the oxygenated blood in the left ventricle. And you know that the left ventricle send blood to the aorta into the systemic circulation. Unfortunately, the blood here is deoxygenated, and therefore you have blue blood going into the kid. That's why they cyanotic at birth, so they are blue. And therefore, for tetralogy of Foley, you have four things: pulmonary artery stenosis, right ventricular hypertrophy, ventricular septal defect and overriding of the aorta. Remember, right ventricular hypertrophy is just modification. It's not part of the uh, triad because this happened because of the pulmonary stenosis, but the pulmonary stenosis, ventricular septal defect and overriding of the aorta are normal portion of the tetralogy of Foley. The right ventricular hypertrophy developed because there's no blood going to the lung. And so these patients are cyanotic. And so that's what happens. This is what usually happens. And all of this 
is right to left shunt. You have blue blood going to the left side and then go into the system. And this is the easy way to remember tetrarity of Foley. You have pulmonary stenosis making right the right side of the heart hold on to the blood and it get bigger and bigger. And it said, I can't do that anymore. Luckily, there's a hole between the right ventricle and the left ventricle. And so blood get pushed into the left ventricle and the left ventricle has no choice but to push out the deoxygenated blood into the circulation. And therefore you have the kid being cyanotic at birth. So that is the summary for all of this. The most important one you need to know is the tetralogy of Foley, which um, it, it, it give you an idea of all the other three and know that they are these um, right to left shunts, they produce cyanotic um, individuals, uh, clients. So we'll, um, I will go through what you expect um, for, for, for symptoms, symptoms that you're going to see in a patient with um, a, a right to left shunt. So right to left shunt. So you have, this is the heart. And blood is being shunted from the right side to the left side. You have deoxygenated blood from here going to here. And this later on go into the systemic circulation. So the kid is going to be what? Cyanotic at birth. There is less blood going to the lung. Therefore, you have less pulmonary conjection. So they don't have the symptoms um, consistent with the pulmonary conjection you see with the left to right shunt. So be careful in the SATA question. They don't have most of the tachypnea, tachycardia with the, uh, like with the left to right shunt, less blood going to the lung because it's being shunted to the right. But the kid is cyanotic. Okay, because of the chronic cyanosis, um, most people, when you have baths and cyanosis, you, you get what we call clubbing of the fingers. Later on, I'll show you pictures later, clubbing of the fingers. So these patients have clubbing of the fingers. That is normal, okay? Every time these kids exert themselves, anything that they can exert themselves, exercise, uh, feeding, or crying. I told you feeding is a form of exercise. So when they feed in, they can become cyanotic. Remember, it's not the same as diaphoretic. The left to right patient become diaphoretic, but um, right to left shunt, become cyanotic when they feed in. The same thing, if you exerting yourself, crying for kids is a loss of exertion. Crying, they become cyanotic. So when the kid is crying, it become cyanotic. Okay? Um, there's one specific thing you need to know for tetralogy of Foley. When they 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 crying or they um they they feeding or they mostly crying or exerting themselves, they become cyanotic. We call it tet spell, T E T spells, or hyper cyanotic spell. Spells. Okay, it's called tet spells or hypersynodic spells. When they crying, they become cyanotic, cyanotic or exerting themselves, they become cyanotic. The best way to take care of this is to prevent less shunting of blood from the right to left. You know, it's a right to left shunt issue. 
So the reason why they have tate spell or hypersynodic spell is because they're becoming more synodic. So in order to prevent that, um, you do need to chest position. Put the kid in the knee to chest position. I call it KTC, knee to chest position. If the kid can do that, if he's a little one and you're holding it, you can swat, swaddle the kid and that bringing the knee to the chest, that like swaddle the kid, and that will also uh, decrease the shunting phenomenon um, and that will prevent the cyanotic. And that may, that may help with the cyanosis. Once again, specifically for the theology of Foley, um, they have this third spell or hypersynodic. And so when they're exerting themselves or they're crying or other things, um, the kid becomes cyanotic. And the best way to decrease the shunting is to put the knee to chest position. And if they, they cannot, or they can squat, it's the same thing as squatting, squatting. If the kid cannot squat, you can swaddle the, the kid and then that will decrease the shunting phenomenon. After that, you need to check their vitals. And if they still becoming cyanotic, give them morphine. And this will make them less anxious. And that will help with the cyanosis. Then you give them oxygen. And you can see knee to chest position. This is like classic SATA question. And the most priority thing you should do, the number one is knee to chest. So they can ask you, a kid is having that spell, what do you do first? Which one is the priority action? They can give you oxygen, they can give you morphine, they can give you vit vitals, um, and then knee to chest position or squat or swaddle. I would choose that knee to chest position uh, as number one priority. But this, you can all do this drawing if it's a SATA question. Once again, these are signs and symptoms. So cyanosis uh, at birth, um, they have less pulmonary conjunction. They have clubbing of the feet and fingers. Feeding, they become cyanotic. Crying, they become cyanotic. The treatment is a uh, need to chest position or swaddle the kid. And um, the other thing I want you to pay attention to, because they are really cyanotic and they have severe cyanosis, your body, whenever you have chronic cyanosis, will lead to hypoxemia. So they start usually low. So your body will be looking for oxygen. Since they cannot get any oxygenated blood, what the body will do is make more red blood cells. If you increase your red blood cells, you increase your hematocrit. The hematocrit can even go up to like 55% or 60. This is what we call polycetemia vera. This is polycetemia vera. It can ask you questions about it. Polycetemia vera can lead to stroke or thrombosis. What it means is the blood is too thick to flow easily. So the blood is so thick to flow easily. And so they get, uh, they can get stroke or thrombosis. The treatment is what we call phlebectomy. So they go and get their blood draw and once a month. So they can ask you this question. Treatment for polycythemia vera is phlebectomy. And the patients who have um, tetralogy of Foley, you should expect them. So this is an expected finding, polycythemia vera. Uh, the hematocrit is very high. Um, they can get stroke from it. And so the treatment is um, phlebectomy. All of the uh, right to left shunt need surgery. It's not compatible to life. So they need surgery 
to fix it. Um, lastly, when you fix them, I'm talking about the right to left shunt, you have to be careful. After it's corrected, um, they may develop periobital edema from all the change in blood flow. They may gain weight. Now they have more blood coming in. They will start to gain weight now. Um, they may Their appetite may go down and they may stop feeding. So you have to pay attention to that. Um, they may have kidney problem too after all the blood flow because of the adaptation that has occurred. So pay attention to that. They can have edema, they can gain weight, they're feeding, they will decrease their feeding. Um, they may have kidney issue. And so before we finish, just want to be, let you know that, I mean, uh, the, the left to right shan't pay attention to the lung issue. One of the ways they can trick you is grunting. When somebody is grunting or they have a pulmonary conjunction, their respiratory effort is increasing. And so when a patient has left to right shunt and they're having respiratory effort, is grunting, G-U-N-T-I-N. It's one of the B-sharp information that I have on my video. You can check it out on prioritization. That is respiratory distress. Um, so this is it briefly on everything you need to know for um, the um, congenital heart disease. Um, we'll do some few questions and then um, you, we can put it together. So you have, this is a question, which of the following clients must be seen first. So this is a priority question. Um, you have one week old with PDA, patent ducted arteriosis and a loud machinery like mama. I told you they usually have allosystolic mama and this is normal finding. It's loud. This is a classic loud machinery like mama. This is an expected finding. This is a priority question, so you got to be sharp instead of being expected. A one-month-old with um, a rate of 55% and a diagnosis of tetralogy of folly. Like I told you, because of the chronic hypoxemia, the red blood cell goes up and the hematocrit goes up. So this is an expected finding. We're looking for being sharp. We have a one week old with a VSD, ventricular septal defect, then with diaphoresis and grunting during feeding. So he has VSD, diaphoresis and grunting during feeding. If you look at B sharp, grunting is one of the symptoms of airway. So this patient is having diaphoresis and granting that is not that is respiratory distress when you're feeding the kid, that kid needs to be seen. So this is a priority patient. A newborn with ASD and a fixed split systolic mama. This is an expected finding. So the correct answer is number three. The next question is um it's a priority, is a SATA question. So which finding would the nurse expect or observe in a one month old client with tetralogy of Foley? So this is a SATA question. Basically, you have to use whatever they're giving you, and then 
compare it to each of the answers given, but you have to know what exactly they're asking you. So we're looking for the tetralogy of Foley. And so we got to make sure each answer satisfy the tetralogy of Foley. So the next, which, which finding would the next suspect or observe in a one month old client with the tetralogy of Foley? So you look at each answer choice and you make sure you make a decision. Don't move until you make a decision and make sure it satisfies what you're being asked, whether you expect or observe. So some expected finding or observation finding. So cyanosis when crying. Yes, when a kid who have tetralogy of Foley, he usually becomes cyanotic when they're crying, when they're exerting themselves. So this is right. Machine like systolic, only systolic mama. This is for PDA. So this is not classic for that. So that's wrong. Cyanosis when feeding. Yes, when they're exerting themselves, feeding is a lot of energy for kids. So that is consistent with um, the tetralogy of Foley. Clubbing of the fingers. This is due to severe hypoxemia, and so this is correct. Polycetemia, this is the same thing. The amortocrate can be very high due to classic uh, clonic hypoxemia. Mother swaddled the infant when crying. This is the same thing as knee to chest position in order to improve, um, decrease uh, shunting and it, it decreased uh, um, improved lung function and provide more oxygen. Therefore, this is expected. So the right answer is one, three, four, five, and six. The last question is, a nurse perform a medication reconciliation on the 34 weeks pregnant client. Which of these medication the nurse should question? So you have 34 weeks pregnant lady taking some medication, you want to question one. One, iron, yes. The patient, you need to take iron. Folate is also, they should be on it. Mr. Prostor, I told you about it. This. First is an it can cause an abortion at the same time it can decrease the level of prostaglandins PGE2 in the in utero. Low level of PGE2 will cause closure of the ductus arteriosus. The kid need the ductus arteriosus to be able to get oxygenated blood into the systemic circulation. As soon as the kid is born and he takes his first breath, the, the ductus arteriosus will close because um, the uh, prostaglandins level decreases. If he persists, it's because there's high level of prostaglandins. Mr. Pristor, we want to keep prostaglandins level I very high in, uh, in utero so that the uh, ductus arteriosus will remain open. If you give them misopristo, the prostaglandin level decreases and causes the ductus arteriosus to close. Premature closure in utero is a problem. And so you got to question this. This is a wrong answer. Vitamin D, 19 wrong. So this is a summary of everything you know about congenital heart problem. And these are key information you need to know for your exams. Uh, pay, I give you the good stuff so that you can use it for your exams. But these are the things you know, just make it easy for you. And um, hopefully um, it, 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 it can help you. And if you like this video, I would like to, to like it on YouTube.
and visit my um, Facebook page. Thank you very much and uh, have a great day.